Well, thank you very much, Stephen, for your, your kind introduction and for the invitation to come along to, to Scrabo this evening. It's a, a real pleasure to be here with you and to be able to, to speak about this important topic. So thank you for the opportunity to do that. We're dealing with a very profound question tonight. In fact, I would say that when we think about the universe we live in, when we think about our own lives and indeed the, the meaning and purpose of our lives, there's probably no more profound question than the question of whether God exists. I'm also going to be looking at science tonight. And science has had a huge impact in our lives in, in all sorts of ways. Science um, has given us this incredible understanding of how the world works uh, in various branches of science, whether it's physics or chemistry, biology, and so forth. Science has uncovered some of these mechanisms and laws and processes by which our world works. But it's also impacted our lives in, in all sorts of ways that we, we take for granted. It's impacted our, our homes, our communication, our travel. I wonder how many of you, even though you knew the way to, to Scrabble this evening, still used your sat-nav. Um, I, I, I certainly did, even though I knew more or less at least where I was coming. The accessibility of information that we have, the incredible developments that have taken place in modern med medicine, and so many other fields that impact our lives in all sorts of ways. And one of the things that I want to look at this evening then is this intriguing possibility that science might be able to shed light on this important question concerning the existence of God. Now, of course, many people have thought so on both sides of this debate. So, for example, about 15 years or so, there really was a very lively debate on the question of science and God. Richard Dawkins, a um, very prominent atheist, um, wrote his book, The God Delusion. Well, I hardly need say more in terms of his perspective. And there he was putting science against belief in God. And in that book he wrote, historically religion aspired to explain our own existence and the nature of the universe in which we find ourselves. In this role, it is now completely superseded by science. But there are other people, eminent scientists, who take a different view. So Francis Collins, for example, who led the Human Genome Project, um, who served under three US presidents as the director of the National Institutes of Health, wrote a book called The Language of God where he said that the God of the Bible is also the God of the genome. He can be worshiped in the cathedral or in the laboratory. His creation is majestic, awesome, intricate, and beautiful. And so science is in effect the language of God. It's telling us something about who God is and the world that he has created. So who's right? How are we to, to make sense of, of this question as to whether science has remove the need for God. Well, what I'd like to do to start with this evening is just to explore why someone might think this. Um, we need to understand the reasoning at work if we're to try to assess the claim that is being made. And so here I, I think a very well expressed um, statement of the position is given by the um, cosmologist Sean Carroll who in an article entitled, Does the Universe Need God?, wrote the following. Over the past 500 years, the progress of science has worked to strip away God's roles in the world. He isn't needed to keep things moving or to develop the complexity of living creatures or to account for the existence of the universe. 2,000 years ago, it was perfectly reasonable to invoke God as an explanation for natural phenomena. Now we can do much better. So here's the idea. It's not that there is something intrinsically um, irrational about belief in God. 
It's just that in light of modern science, as it explains more and more about the way the world works, God has increasingly become irrelevant or redundant. Or to use my terminology, science has explained God away. That is basically the claim that he's making. So let's, let's look at this just in terms of a, of a diagram. 2,000 years ago, he says, belief in God was perfectly reasonable. We look at this incredible world that we live in with the amazing complexity and structure and order and so forth, precisely the kinds of things, of course, that scientists study, um, which is why Carroll and Dawkins would say the same. Um, it, it did make sense for people to believe in God in the past. And so we have God represented here as, a, as providing an explanation for the natural world that we live in. However, then we have science coming along and also then providing us with this explanation of the world that we live in. Then the key move. Now that science has explained the natural world around us, God drops out of the picture. There's no longer any need for God. Science has explained God away. Now just to emphasize a key point about this skeptical perspective, in fact, a couple of points. The first one is that God and science are considered to provide rival explanations. Okay? I think that's an underlying assumption here. They're giving us not only different, but rival explanations as to how the world works. And, of course, if we accept the scientific explanation, and the assumption here is that we should and we do, then there's no need for God any longer. And that follows inevitably if you have set them up as rival explanations in the first place. I've had the privilege in a couple of projects that I've worked on um, to look at this question of explaining away. How exactly does it work? And when do explanations come into conflict with each other and undermine one another or potentially combined together to give you a better overall explanation. And it just differs from one case to another. Let me give you a couple of examples. So let's suppose that you get up tomorrow morning to go to work. And you, let's suppose, drive to work and you get into your car to start your journey, but the car doesn't start. So what could the problem be? Well, here are two possibilities. One, there might be a, a problem with the engine. There might, you might have a, a, a faulty engine. Uh, but that's not the only possibility. It, it might be that you have a, a faulty starter motor in your car. Uh, now, if you're like me, if your um, knowledge of car mechanics is as, uh, is as advanced as mine is, then you won't have a clue which of those it is, or indeed whether it might be some other explanation. So you call a mechanic, and the mechanic comes along and gets into your car, quickly checks out a couple of things. It's your starter motor. We'll get that fixed, and you'll be fine. But now you're, you're somebody who thinks a lot about explanation. And you say, well, how do you know that's the only problem? I mean, it could be that I have a, that, that there's a problem with the engine as well, right? But the, the mechanic isn't persuaded. Why? Well, there's no need for two explanations when one will do. The mechanic knows that the faulty starter motor would explain the problem. So, I mean, okay, you could be having a really bad Monday. I mean, you could be really unlucky. It could be that you have a faulty engine and a faulty starter motor, but there's no reason to suppose that both problems are there when you know you have one and that accounts for all the evidence that accounts for the problem. Knowing that it's a faulty starter motor makes the other explanation redundant. And so that is not a million miles away from the sort of reasoning that some people use with regard to science and God. Now that we've got science, the other explanation is no longer needed. 
But now let me give you another example. Why am I here tonight? Well, one explanation for why I'm here tonight is because I, I left my home, got into my car, and drove here. I think that's a, a pretty good explanation as to why I'm here. But there's another explanation. Another explanation is that I was invited here. Now, what about those two explanations? I mean, would you conclude, learning that I had driven here tonight, that therefore there was really no need for the other explanation, that I was invited to speak? Well, no, of, of course you wouldn't conclude that. Um, I mean, the fact that I'm here, of course, suggests that I was invited to speak. The two explanations work together. Now, of course, you, you might wonder why I was invited to speak after the talk's over, uh, uh, but that's an entirely different question. The point is that these two explanations go together. In fact, they go together in quite an interesting way because, of course, the reason I drove here was because I'd been invited in the first place. The two explanations work together. So the point of this is that sometimes explanations do compete with each other, if we want to put it in that way. One will make the other redundant, but other times they work together seamlessly. And so the question is, which is it concerning science and God? Now, actually, I'm not at all convinced that Carroll and Dawkins and so forth have really made their case. They have, it seems to me, just broadly assume that scientific and religious explanations must inevitably be in competition with each other. But this idea would certainly have come as a, a surprise to the founders of modern science. When we think about how at least modern science has developed, um, actually what we find are, are many figures like um, Newton and Kepler, Galileo, Boyle, um, people who believed in God, some of them very devout Christians. And actually, it was their belief in God that motivated their science. As it has often been put, it was because they believed in a lawgiver that they went looking for these laws to explain and describe the natural world. Far from seeing science and, and God as rivals, actually God was the ultimate source of everything, including science itself. The, the idea that they would then have gone and done their science, that Newton would have discovered the law of gravitation and concluded from that, that that somehow undermined belief in the existence of God. I mean, Newton simply wouldn't have understood what you were saying. Not at all. For, for these thinkers, the two went together. Kepler, for example, talked about thinking God's thoughts after him, that when we study the natural world, it's giving us a, a sort of insight, if you like, into the mind of the Creator. Or they talked about God's two books, the book of, of Scripture, but also the book of nature, that it would reveal something of the, the handiwork of God. As the eminent historian Peter Harrison um, has pointed out, there was a, a really important move in terms of the history of science when Christian thinkers applied God's sovereignty to the natural realm in a new way, asserting that nature was governed by God-designed mathematical laws. Before this, Yes, there certainly were ideas of, of laws, natural laws, but these were to do with morality. The idea that there were laws that described the physical universe that we live in was a, a key development. And as I've already mentioned, this was promoted by these thinkers who believed in a law giver. So, for example, we have Johannes Kepler. The chief aim of all investigations of the natural world should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God and which he reveals to us in the language of mathematics. So just as we under need to understand a language, if we want to understand a book, if we have a book written in some other language, well, we, we need it interpreted or we need, um, we need to learn the language, well, 
Nature is also written in language, was Kepler's point. It's written in the language of mathematics. And this is the language in which God has written, if you like, the book of nature. So, for these sorts of reasons, I don't think there is any reason to think that science and belief in God are inevitably in conflict at all. Far from it, I think they can work together seamlessly. Um, and indeed, belief in God can motivate scientific work. But let's turn to another aspect of Christian belief particularly, because of course Christian belief is not merely about belief in the existence of God, but in the person of Jesus. And ultimately, it hinges on this miraculous event, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, what about miracles? Does science explain miracles away? Well, many people have thought so. Many people have thought that science somehow rules out miracles. But I must admit, I've, I've always struggled really to, to see exactly what the objection is. Um, at least in principle, why anyone would think there is a problem here. Um, I mean, so here's the idea. Science works by explaining the world around us. So we can use scientific laws to describe a physical system where we know the state of the physical system and we know the relevant physical forces and so on that are at work within the world. What science cannot do is tell us whether there is anything else at work, whether there's anything else going on. And in particular, of course, I would say then it cannot tell us whether God might be at work within the natural world. We simply couldn't apply the laws of physics in the normal way if there's something else going on that's not factored into our equations. Of course, once that event does take place, then science can get on with the business of describing the world and explaining what takes place afterwards. But it can't rule out the possibility that there is something else going on. Now, this is, of course, not to say that you should believe every claim about a miracle. Of course not. Um, a degree of skepticism is certainly appropriate. And of course, it does raise the question as to how exactly we would go about weighing up the evidence for a particular miracle. But nevertheless, that seems the right direction to go in. And indeed, it seems like the right kind of scientific mindset with, with regards to this question. It's to, rather than rule miracles out, it's to say, well, let's consider the evidence. Now, of course, this is a huge topic then as to why, how and why we should consider the evidence and how we should weigh up that evidence. But I just don't see any good reason at all for thinking that the evidence must always come down against the miracle. We've got to be open-minded and consider the evidence. For what it's worth, when it comes to this central miracle of the Christian faith, um, the more I looked into it, the more I've discovered that there really are good historical grounds for this. Um, when I started exploring many of these issues, it did seem to me that, well, yeah, science and God, I don't think there's necessarily any conflict there. Um, but when it comes to the resurrection or something like that, I mean, how could you, how could you really establish that? But actually, the more I've looked into it, the more I'm convinced that the evidence is really very strong. But alas, that is not our topic for this evening, exciting a topic as it is. The basic point is that science doesn't rule out the miraculous. Let's summarize what I've been trying to say so far, um, or at least to, to highlight certain concerns with how people might approach this. Science explains many features of the natural world that we can agree on, but that doesn't mean it explains away, it doesn't explain away either God or miracles. So we need to be careful when we look at these debates from the move from science explains, we can all agree with that, but then moving from that to therefore science explains away, that's, that's importantly 
different, and we, we ought to be careful about that move. Secondly, a, a sort of related claim here is that science explains, again, we grant that, but that doesn't mean it explains everything. That's a view known as scientism. It's not science itself. That's a kind of philosophical add-on, if you like, that some people make to assume that science can just explain everything. So again, I think we ought to be cautious about people moving from, yes, science explains, and we go along with that and happily agree, of course, that it does. That's wonderful for explaining many features of the world around us, but that it explains everything. Well, now, where did that come in? So we need to be cautious about that sort of claim. Let me also just clarify what I'm not saying for so far. I'm not saying that there is no possibility for there being a conflict between science and Christian belief. Um, of course there could be. And when we look at the, at the history, there have been certain cases where there have certainly been differences of opinion, and quite often you've had scientists on different sides and Christians on different sides of the debates. So there can be conflicts, but there's no reason to think that there's a, an inevitable conflict at all. In fact, I would say in the history of all of this, the broad picture is that the two work together. So we've been looking so far at whether science might explain God away, but can we go a bit further than that? Could science provide an answer to our original question concerning the existence of God, but actually give us some evidence for the existence of God or pointers towards the existence of God? Well, in order to, to think about this claim, let me just very briefly articulate two different ways of thinking about the world. Represented in the diagram here on the left, we have the naturalistic or atheistic view. This is that the material world is fundamental. And so matter develops and evolves over time and produces mind, like our minds. On the right hand side, we have things completely reversed. It's the opposite way around. It's that mind is fundamental, the mind of, of God. Um, and matter is derivative, okay? God is the creator of the material world. Both of these views have a very long history. There have been very intelligent people on both sides. The question that I want to consider for a few minutes this evening is whether science might provide some pointers towards belief in God, towards the right-hand um, diagram on this figure. So let me look at three. Three pieces of evidence or three pointers. The first one concerns the rational order of the universe. So we've already touched on this a little bit. But one of the things that science has, of course, discovered, and over the 20th century and into the 21st century, it's making incredible discoveries about just the unbelievable order and complexity that we find in the world whether that's at the large-scale structure of the, the universe as a whole, galaxy formation, and all the rest of it, whether it's right down at the atomic or subatomic level, again, incredible order and structure, or whether it's in between at the, at the level of life, for example, the unbelievable complexity in every cell of every living organism on earth like a miniature factory doing all the processing of generating the proteins and everything that is needed for life to thrive. The question is, why is the universe like this? Why is it so incredibly ordered? And this is, of course, something that is part of science. I mean, we just recognize this, that, you know, this is why we study it, to try to make sense of all of this order and complexity. Now, you might say, well, doesn't science explain this order? I mean, isn't that what scientific laws do? They explain all of this order. But I, I think there's a, a problem with this. In fact, I think there are two problems with this. One is that the scientific laws don't explain how these things came about in the first place. Um, 
how the, the universe came into existence. We'll talk about that more in a moment or about why we have these complex structures. And secondly, it doesn't explain where those scientific laws themselves came from. They are precisely what needs explaining. Why is our universe governed by these kinds of laws? Now, of course, the early scientists we looked at um, a while ago, they had a clear answer to this. Well, it's because there is a lawgiver, there's a creator, an intelligent mind behind our universe. That would explain why our universe is the way it is. And so if we compare these two worldviews, these two perspectives we looked at a few minutes ago, I would say that in the atheistic perspective, the, there's no reason why the universe should contain so much order, but it's just what we'd expect if there is a creator, if there is a God. And so I would suggest that this evidence of the order of the universe points us in the direction of a creator. Well, let me go on to the second one, and this concerns the beginning of the universe. If we go back about 100 years, there was quite a consensus amongst the scientists that at, at least as far as astronomy was concerned, there was no evidence to suggest that the universe had come into existence in the past. I mean, it just looked as if it had always been pretty much the way it is now. I mean, of course, um, that's not to say there'd been no change, but pretty much in terms of the large-scale structure of the universe, it looked like it had more or less always been this way. Indeed, this idea was so entrenched that the great Albert Einstein made what he later claimed to be his, his biggest blunder. When he developed his theory of, of general relativity, it looked like it required the universe to be either expanding or contracting. So what did Einstein do? The great Einstein, well, he, he fudged his equations. He put in an extra term, the cosmological constant, to ensure that the universe was static, neither expanding nor contracting. Why did he consider it to be his greatest mistake? Well, 1929, with Edwin Hubble's discovery of this distant, this distant light um, from galaxies within the universe being what's called red-shifted. And it turned out, as they explored this, that this, the conclusion was that the universe was expanding. It wasn't static at all. It was expanding, just as Einstein's equations had suggested before he put in that extra term. It didn't take people too long to work out the consequences of this. If the universe is expanding, then if you go back into the past, it must have been contracting. And in fact, contracting right back to nothing. A beginning? Well, I don't know what you make of, of this in terms of the science. Of course, this might raise a question for us. How does this fit with the Bible? We can explore those sorts of questions maybe later. But for the atheistic scientists, this posed an enormous problem. Because if the universe had a beginning, well, how could that happen? I mean, if atheism was true, the assumption was the universe has always been here. The material universe has always been here. So how could it come into existence out of nothing? Of course, um, as Stephen Hawking, himself a, a, an atheist, said this was a real problem because it smacked of divine intervention. And of course, many people pointed this out. This was very much in keeping with the first verse of the Bible, that in the beginning God created the heavens and, and the earth. And of course, this is what Christians had always believed, that God created the universe out of nothing. And here was the interesting, interesting thing that 20th century science seemed to agree. Now, there's much more that can be said about all of these topics. And I'm not saying that this proves it's true. I'm not saying it proves absolutely that the universe had a beginning. 
but it's an intriguing development that took place in 20th century science. And many people have objected to it for a variety of reasons, but I would suggest that as more and more evidence came in, it confirmed this picture of the universe having had a beginning. And so, to summarize, from an atheistic perspective, this evidence is extremely surprising, to say the least, if there's no God. But if there is a God, then it's evidence for a beginning. This evidence is, is just the sort of thing we might have expected. Okay, well, let's go on to the final one, my third piece of evidence, and this concerns what's called the fine-tuning of the universe, sometimes referred to as the Goldilocks enigma. Remember the story, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right, okay? The idea in this context is that our universe is just right for life, and this has been something that scientists have, have really been amazed at, a whole range of discoveries made over the last 50 years or so um, about just how fine-tuned our universe is. So to take a few quick examples, and there are many of them, the balance between the gravitational and electromagnetic forces, these two fundamental forces of nature, has been argued to, to, to need to be um, balanced to about one part in 10 to the power of 40 in order for life to exist. Had it been different, we wouldn't be here tonight. To take another one, the cosmological constant. Um, earlier, I talked about it in terms of Einstein introducing it for dubious reasons, um, but it has since turned out that we do need one after all for different reasons because it appears that our universe is, is not only expanding but accelerating in its expansion. But this cosmological constant needs to be accurate to about one part in 10 to the power of 53. That's a, you know, one with 53 zeros after it. Or just to take one more, the low entropy conditions of the early universe. The, the Nobel Prize winning mathematical physicist, Sir Roger Penrose from Oxford, um, refers to what he calls the creator's aim in creation. Now, he's an agnostic himself, but he, he refers to the creator's aim. How accurate did the creator need to be at this very early moment in the universe? Well, he says that it had to be accurate to one part and 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. Well, if you're doing mathematics, you might know what I'm talking about. If you don't, let me just say that if I try to write it down as 10 to the power of a one with noughts after it, you couldn't write this number down if you used up the entire universe to write it. Um, this is just a staggering um, a accuracy that is needed. The interesting thing about this, this is, as I've suggested, uh, referring to Penrose, this is, is not just something that Christians have been saying. This is just a finding of science, that our universe is just right for life. The question then is, what is the best explanation of it? Well, let's just take Stephen Hawking, who, who again, as I mentioned earlier, is, is an atheist, but just to summarize the, the case so far, he says, were it not for a series of startling coincidences and the precise details of physical law, it seems humans and similar life forms would never have come into being. Or Sir Fred Hoyle, um, who really objected to the idea of a beginning of the universe because of his atheism, considering some of these remarkable coincidences in the natural world, this so-called fine-tuning, said that a common-sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. Incredible accuracy needed just as is needed to hit the bullseye. How accurate? Well, let's just take that first scenario, one in 10 to the power of 40. So let's suppose that it was one in a thousand, right? I mean, that's manageable, one in a thousand, but, but even consider that. I mean, let's suppose we had a box here with a thousand balls in it, um, a thousand ping pong balls, let's say, um, and 
999 of them are red, but there's one white one in there. So you're blindfolded, and you put your hand in just to select one at random. Chances that you'll get the white one? One in a thousand. Okay? But now imagine a box, not with a thousand in it, but 10,000 trillion, trillion, trillion. And again, you're blindfolded. Well, what are your chances now of getting the, the one white ball in that box out of all the other red ones? Well, that's the kind of accuracy that is needed just for one of these examples of the Goldilocks enigma. So this has really brought the idea of an intelligent mind, an intelligent designer, really back to the fore in terms of, of where the science is, is taking us. Um, now, again, this is a huge topic, and there is much to explore and debate and different viewpoints. Um, nobody, I think, thinks that we just got lucky. The, the numbers are just too astronomical for that. Some people have tried to appeal to the idea that our universe is just one of many, possibly infinitely many. Um, but I, I think this, I think this uh, really falls short in comparison with a much more straightforward explanation that there is indeed a super intellect. There is a mind behind the universe who has made it with this incredible order. So summarizing the case then, this Goldilocks enigma, extremely surprising, I would suggest, if atheism is true, but not at all surprising if there's a God. And so from these three evidences or pointers, it seems to me that the science actually does help us in thinking about this big question concerning the existence of God. Taking us over to the right-hand side of the screen, that this um, this picture that as God is the creator provides a better account of the universe that we live in. Well, let me draw towards a, a conclusion now. Um, we've looked at whether science explains God away. I've suggested that it doesn't, or at least there's no good reason to think that it does. Um, in fact, I, I think a very plausible picture is that the two work together. Secondly, then, I've tried to go further than that and say, well, science actually might still help provide an answer, but in exactly the opposite direction, that modern science and the discoveries it's making actually provide pointers towards the existence of God. But lastly, I want to briefly turn to the question of evidence and faith, because some people think that there is a problem here, a conflict. Again, Richard Dawkins says that faith is a state of mind that leads people to believe something, it doesn't matter what, in the total absence of evidence. Sir Gillian Prance, who was the um, director of the Royal Botanic uh, Gardens in Kew, um, a botanist um, and a, a devout Christian, says that for many years I've believed that God is the great designer behind all nature. All my studies in science since then have confirmed my faith. Again, you wonder why such polarized views. And I think there is a, a difference here in terms of what they mean by faith. Dawkins is quite clear about it, isn't he? Faith is believing something for which there's no evidence. In fact, in the total absence of evidence is the way he puts it. Well, of course, we do use the word faith sometimes to mean that, don't we? I mean, if, if uh, I said that um, I thought Northern Ireland would win the next World Cup, you might say, well, that takes a lot of faith. How could you believe that? Um, so, so that is a usage of the word faith. Is it the Christian usage of the word faith? Believing something for which there's no evidence. Because if, if that's what it is, then um, Gillian Prance has all, got it all wrong, hasn't he? Um, because how, how, could, how could his studies in science confirm his faith if faith is believing something in the absence of evidence? He must mean something different. So what does he mean? And more generally, what do Christians mean by the notion of faith? Well, here I think it's helpful to distinguish between two notions, believing that something is true and believing in something. So here's a, 
a picture um, of the Carricka Reed Rope Bridge. I don't know how many of you have, have crossed the Carricka Reed Rope Bridge. But let's suppose you, you, you go up uh, to the north coast and you, you go to the, the bridge and you're thinking of, of going across. And it sounded like a great idea when you set out from home that morning, but now you're in two minds. Should I cross or not? Well, it turns out you're very fortunate because when you went on your journey, you brought along your engineer friend. And your engineer can do all the checks. Checks uh, the rope. Checks uh, the strength of the bridge. Checks that it will be sufficient to bear your weight if you walk across it. Checks the uh, weather conditions, the wind, and so forth. It's safe, he assures you. You can cross. It's no problem. But you're still in two minds. Why? Lack of evidence? No, no, you've got plenty of evidence. But it still takes faith to step out onto that bridge. And I think this captures something of what the Christian perspective is. It's not just belief that it will trust me. You know that. You've got the evidence, okay? It's whether I trust in it to take that step of faith. It's not a blind leap into the dark. It, it's not as if um, you have no evidence to go on and you can't see this and it's dark and you're just asked to step out with a blind leap of faith onto this bridge. No, there's, there's evidence. You can, you can assess that evidence. But it still requires you to take that step of faith. And so it is, I think, with the Christian faith as well. It's more than just weighing up the evidence. And so one of the mistakes that someone might make tonight in listening to this talk is, well, it's really just all about sitting down and weighing up all these arguments and there are these clever people on all sides of the debate and etc., etc. How am I ever to weigh it all up? Well, what I would suggest is that this is not simply a matter of solving an intellectual problem. If there is a God... There's more to it than that. I don't think God is interested in us just forming a new belief. Ah, yes, there's a God. No, if Christianity is true, God wants to transform our lives and invite us into a, a new and living relationship with himself. And so it's more like that step of faith. And so I would suggest as you approach these questions... Approach it with both of them in mind. The evidence, weighing it up, but also thinking about, well, what about my life? Where, where do I find the meaning and purpose in my life? Am I willing to be changed and transformed by God? Am I willing to take that step of faith, not that blind leap of faith in the dark, but to take that first step across the bridge? So, I would encourage you to Explore these issues further yourself, but I will end there for now. Thank you.